Okay, thank you everyone for uh, joining the Spatial Omics Seminar Series 7. And uh, the seminar today uh, is going to be given by uh, uh, Dr. Tianming Zhou. And so uh, Dr. Zhou um, is currently a PhD student uh, at a Carnegie Mellon working with uh, Professor Gemma in the Department of uh, Computer Science or School of Computer Science. And I, uh, I think Tian Ming received his undergrad degree from Tsinghua University. Uh, uh, so he went through a very prestigious uh, talent program called the Yao class. And afterwards he moved to US and, uh, and worked in uh, Professor Jiamas lab uh, in, in the field of um, so machine learning and a, and uh, omics data analysis. Uh, uh, I, I think in the, the, the laboratory uh, he's working in, Professor Jiamas lab is really one of the pioneers in, in the space of 3D genome data analysis and a recent uh, venture into the spatial omics and a lot of exciting pipelines uh, being developed over there. Uh, so today we are gonna hear one of those called Spice Mix and developed by uh, Tian Ming. So, all right, so uh, yeah, we just uh, can't wait to hear more uh, exciting stuff from your work and uh, the floor is yours. Cool. Okay, thank you so much for your introduction. Yeah, so, um, uh, um, hello everyone, it is great to be with you all today and talk, talk about my research. I'm Tian Ming Zhou, of course, they are a PhD student at the Math Lab. Today, I will be presenting our new tool called SpaceMix, which is a computational method for integrative spatial modeling of the spatial transcriptomic data. This is joint work with Ben, Xiaohu, and Zhenma. So I'd like to first give a short intro introduction about the techniques that generate spatial transcriptomic datasets. Due to the time limit, I will only cover the datasets we have analyzed. Spatial transcriptomic techniques mainly can be categorized into imaging-based method and sequencing-based methods. In imaging-based methods, we usually can locate the uh, spatial location of single mRNA molecules in the 2D or 3D space. So the gene impression is at single cell resolution or even at subcellular resolution. However, we can only measure genes from a pre-selected gene panel, which contains only 1,000 or up to 10,000 genes. In contrast, in imaging-based methods, the full transcriptum can be measured, but the resolution is not single cell, at least not so far. In other words, one spot may contain multiple cells, possibly from different uh, cell types. As a result, the gene impression of one spot actually is the average impression of multiple different cells. And the deconvolution of cell type compositions is not a trivial task. So we currently have two major categories of spatial transcriptomic techniques with different trade-offs. Here we uh, review current computational methods that are related to spasmix, such as non-negative matrix factorization, hidden Markov random field, base space and SPARGCN. NMF and its variants, such as Liger, are widely used in single cell RNA seq analysis. These methods infer continuous embeddings for single cells, but they cannot leverage the power of spatial information. Hidden Markov random field is a generic probabilistic model for hard clustering. It has a strong assumption that neighboring cells or a neighboring spouse are likely to belong to the same cluster, which is not true in real spatial transcriptomic datasets. Base space is also a generative model, but it has it also has the same strong assumptions as in HMRI, and its primary goal is also clustering. This may hinder its ability to identify continuous trajectories at single cell or single spot resolution. SPARGCN is a graph convolutional neural network model, but its latent embedding potentially um, lacks interpretability and its primary goal is also clustering. In contrast, 
So primary goal of SpaceMix is to learn a continuous and interpretable latent embedding from spatial transcriptomic data. Unlike hidden Markov random field and space space, SpaceMix is also, uh, is, is also able to infer that spatial dependency between neighboring cells from the data without any strong assumptions. So clustering tasks can be done as an additional step in the downstream analysis. So in summary, SpaceMix is a spatially informed method for latent representation learning. Now I will give, a, give an overview of SpaceMix. SpaceMix is an analysis tool that can operate on spatial transcriptomic datasets acquired by any method. And SpaceMix can reveal spatially variable features and cell states, such as um, discrete cell types and continuous trajectories. Here I'm using an image-based dataset just for illustration. We format the gene impression by a cell by gene matrix and model it using the conventional non-negative matrix factorization. For those who are not very familiar with NMF, I will give a short introduction about it. In NMF, the gene profile of cell I, denoted by uh, Y here, is assumed to be the weighted average of metagenes. The metagenes are shared across all cells and are collectively denoted by M, a gene by three matrix in this case, as we have um, three factors in this example. Each metagene is supposed to capture the typical impression of one particular biological factor, such as cell types and uh, differentiation trajectories. The so mixed width of cell I is uh, denoted by X, X, Xi, which is a vector of length Z. This vector represents the uh, continue contribution of each metagene to cell I's observed observation depression. The mixing weights are very useful and are regarded as the latent embedding or latent representation. So in NMF, NMF formulates the observed single cell impression as a weighted combination of metagenes. However, as mentioned earlier, the latent embeddings are mutually independent in the convention, conventional NMF. So the so key technical inno innovation of SpaceMix is that the latent embeddings are related to each other through a graphical model, the hidden Markov random field. In this graph, every node is one cell, and its hidden state is the cell's latent embedding. The edges represent the neighboring relationship between cells and are derived from the spatial coordinates of single cells. The pairwise potential function quantifies the spatial affinity between uh, a pair of cells and has a form of uh, weighted inner product. The weight matrix sigma uh, has a shape of metagene by metagene and its elements are the affinity for every pair of metagenes. The affinity quantifies uh, if a pair of metagenes tend to be near each other or tend to repel each other. A key point is that we do not assume to know a priori the affinity between metagenes, and instead we learn the affinity from the data. So the learnable affinity of metagenes enables specimics to capture metagenes with various spatial patterns. Once we uh, fit the model to the data, specimics produces a latent representation of the cells X and the metagenes denoted by M, and also the spatial affinity between metagenes which is uh, uh, the matrix sigma. This output can um, collectively provide insight into various biological factors in spatial transcriptomic data. So the complete likelihood of, of SpaceMix is, is given by this formula. The probabilistic graphical model of SpaceMix consists of um, the spatial dependency, matrix factorization of, of observed gene impression and also an optional regularization term of the latent states. And the theta is the partition function. So if implicit forms of the probabilities are as follows. For the 
observe the gene impression. The potential function is basically the PDF of a Gaussian distribution. For the spatial dependency, we include the pairwise potential uh, for every pair of neighboring cells. Note that um, the formula of the spatial potential function is a little bit more complicated. We actually normalized the latent states by the R1 norm to remove potential um, confounding factors. Mathematically, this also ensures the feasible region of normalized latent states is bounded so that the partition function is always finite. Besides, with this form, the calculation of the partition function is tractable under mild approximation. Additionally, we also uh, include a regularization term to the spatial affinity matrix. We assume an IID Gaussian prior for the elements in sigma, the, the affinity matrix. The mean is assumed to be zero and the variance um, or the regularization strength lambda sigma is a hyperparameter. This hyperparameter balances the weights between spatial dependency and the gene impression. Mathematically, if we set lambda sigma to infinity, the um, affinity matrix will be four of zero. And then the model is reduced to the common, conventional non-negative matrix factorization. So in other words, the conventional NMF is a special case of specimens when the spatial information is not available. To fit the model to the data, we treat it as an MAP problem where we are maximizing the complete likelihood of the data, including both the observed impression and the latent states given uh, model parameters. To solve this, we use a co coordinate ascend approach alternating between uh, maximizing the probability of latent embedding given the parameter estimates and vice versa. As we incorporated continuous latent embeddings and the learnable uh, affinity matrix, the optimization presents many technical challenges and, and we encourage you to read the details in, in our paper if you are interested. Together, we propose a specific a probabilistic vertical model, and we treat the inference as the optimization of the complete likelihood solved by coordinate ascent. Um, we first evaluated specimics on synthetic data sets that resemble the mouse cortex, which is a tissue in many recent spatial transcriptomic studies. The mouse cortex consists of several layers from superficial layers to deep layers and, and three major um, cell types, two neuronal types and glial cells. These cell types exhibit different spatial patterns in that uh, excitatory, neurons, excitatory neuronal types are specific to particular layers, such as layers one to four in this example, while others are found in uh, roughly sparsely and evenly throughout the tissue. In the red figure are the managing compositions that give rise to the observed gene impression. We generated managings that are specific to major types or minor types or even layers like mm, this one. We then generated the observed gene impression according to the uh, NMF formulation. So these are some examples of the spatial distribution of managings. Managing six is uh, specific to the right inhibitory neuronal type and is sparsely distributed in layers um, three and four. In contrast, managing seven is restricted to layer one. So the cell types and the managings in the synthetic data, data sets have various spatial patterns which uh, resemble the phenomena in real mass cortex. Here we show that Splasmix is able to recover metagenes with various spatial patterns. In the red figure, we are uh, still visualizing the in situ impression of the two aforementioned metagenes, a sparse one and a layer specific one. As shown in the figure, 
the managing pattern inferred by Spasmix is very similar to the uh, one truth, whereas the pattern found by NMF includes a high level of background noise. Because other methods do not infer metagenes, we did not compare specimens with them for this task. And then we demonstrate the advantage of specimens at recovering cell type annotations. The lab figures are the in situ map of the true annotations and the annotation inferred by different computational methods. Here we focus on layer specific excitatory uh, neuronal clusters from uh, ER1 to ER4. If one cell is assigned with the correct annotation, we color it by a fainted color. Otherwise, the cell is colored by a uh, dark gray. As shown in the figure, uh, there are much fewer gray dots in the in situ map of spasmic annotation, indicating the accuracy of spasmics is much higher than other methods. Uh, we also quantified the performance by the AR, ARS score at different noise levels, and we found that SPACE-MIX consistently outperformed other methods. So in simulated data, we have demonstrated the consistent advantage of SPACE-MIX for recovering math dreams and cell type annotations. We then start to study the mouse visual cortex by using SPACE-MIX to analyze a real spatial transcriptomic data set acquired by the StarMap method. This data set consists of a single field of view of 930 cells with measurements of uh, 1,020 genes. We use SPACE-MIX to produce metagenes and a latent representation of cells. With the downstream analysis, we did clustering on the single cell latent representation to generate the cell type annotations. In the right figure is the UMAP visualization of the latent representation and is colored by the cell type annotations inferred by SPACMIX. The figure at the bottom shows the in situ cell type annotations also inferred by SPACMIX. We found that SPACMIX identified um, rare subtypes that have similar equation but different spatial patterns. Specimens also identified a continuous trajectory from OPCs to, to mature oligodendrocytes. As I mentioned earlier, specimens is designed to capture managings with various spatial patterns. Indeed, in StarMap, specimens inferred managings with different spatial patterns. For example, uh, managing 11, was uh, roughly evenly spread in the tissue, whereas managing 12 was restricted to either the most superficial part or a deep region. These two managings actually led to the separation of two extra set subtypes. Astro 1, those in uh, colored in purple, is diffused over the cortex, whereas Astro 2, colored in magenta, is uh, restricted to the um, gliolimitants which is a very thin layer in the superficial side. The gene impressions of the two subtypes are very similar, so other unsupervised methods cannot separate them. Their identities were also supported by the impression of known marker genes, such as GFAP for Astro 2 and MFGE8 for Astro 1. So as specimens learns the spatial affinity from the data, Specimens identified two extra set subtypes. Similarly, among oligodendrocytes, another type of glial cells, specimens also found two subtypes, one diffused throughout the cortex layers and another restricted to the deep cortex. But the most interesting part is uh, specimens actually identified the OPCs or oligodendrocyte precursor cells, which is um, you know, roughly a, a less differentiated form for, uh, of oligodendrocytes. So to confirm the differentiation trajectory from OPCs to oligodendrocytes, we applied monocontour on the role gene expression of these cells. And indeed, we found a 
continuous trajectory from OPC to oligo one. Oligo two appears to be uh, far away from this trajectory, which might be because oligo two is too different from OPC and oligo one. So we only focus on OPC and oligo one here. So then we check the metagene impression in OPC and oligo one. Surprisingly, the impression of metagenes 12 and 13 is highly correlated with um, this trajectory. As we move from OPC to, um, oligo, to mature oligo-1, the impression level of metagene 12 is gradually elevated, and the metagene 13 shows the opposite trend. This highly suggests that specimens unveiled this uh, trajectory. To further uh, confirm this, we visualize the single cell equation of the two metagenes, and they are indeed linearly anti-correlated. So we define the single cell pseudotype as the difference uh, in the proportion of these two metagenes. We then ask which biological process uh, gave rise to this trajectory, and we found that the myelination process must drive this trajectory. We found more than 10 myelination related genes, such as PRP1. At single cell level, the impression of most of these genes are correlated with the pseudo time, as shown uh, in this example. So, this results indicate that Spasmix is able to capture uh, these differentiation trajectories, and we attribute it to the modern part where we uh, treat the latent representation as a continuum. We then studied another spatial transcriptome dataset acquired by the SIGPH Plus dataset. This dataset also, is also from the mouse visual cortex and include a panel of 10,000 genes and higher coverage, which, which can be used to provide um, more insight after we apply spasmix to the SIGPH plus dataset, spasmix separates uh, two rare inhibitory subtypes, VIP and SST. Spasmix also identified a trajectory of uh, oligodendron sets maturation. This trajectory is uh, similar to the one found in the star map dataset, but since we have more genes in this dataset, spasmix unveiled more details about this trajectory including the separation of uh, mature oligodendron sets to an early stage and to a, a, a late stage. So this trajectory is from oligodendron set precursor cells to early mature oligodendron set, and then finally to late mature oligodendron set. In the UMAP plot, the local structures from OPC to oligo E and then to oligo L already, um, already shows already implied these trajectories. Um, the identities of the three differentiation stages were supported by known marker genes, including the marker genes that separate OPCs from mature oligodendron sets, and the marker genes that separate um, oligodendron sets at the early stage from those at the late stage. Uh, since the coverage of this data set uh, was still not very high. The equation matrix was, uh, was very sparse, which means that for most genes, the equation in more than half of the cells was zero. So to compare the equation distribution of marked genes in different clusters, we visualize two quantities for each gene. At the bottom, uh, at the bottom is the percentage of cells in one particular gene. So here shows that each of the three OPC marker genes was expressed in uh, maybe more than half of the OPCs, but only in a small portion of mature oligodendrocytes. Conversely, the marker genes of mature oligodendrocytes were expressed in a higher percentage of oligodendrocytes than in OPCs. And the trends are similar in the other figure. So this is, these trends are consistent with the effective pattern of marker genes. 
So this is the first quantity, the percentage of cells expressed in a particular gene. The second quantity is just the expression level and is shown in the top figures. The boxes do not start at zero because uh, in these figures, we ignore cells that do not express the gene. Similarly, the oligo, um, the oligo, um, the OPC marker genes was, um, was, were also expressed at a higher level in OPCs compared to mature oligodendrocytes. And the oligo E marker genes were expressed at a higher level in oligo E than in oligo L. These two quantities collectively support the identities of the three clusters. Now to understand how Spasmix discovered this trajectory, we uh, visualized the impression levels of metagenes for the three clusters. We found that metagene 8 was highly impressed in the early stage OPC, and metagene 7 was enriched in the latest stage on oligo L. Interestingly, uh, both metagene 7 and 8 were impressed in the intermediate stage oligo E at a moderate level. This confirms that the two managings revealed this trajectory. So in summary, uh, in the StarMap and SIGFISH Plus datasets, the technical normatives enable SPASMIX to infer a better latent representation, which provide additional biological insight. Since the metagene affinity was learned from the data, SPASMIX identified uh, metagenes and cell types with different spatial patterns. This also led to the identification of rare subtypes. By treating latent representation as a continuum, SPASMIX also inferred continuous trajectories. Now we move to a VZM data set from the human prefrontal, uh, dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. Similar to the mouse cortex, uh, this tissue also has a layer-like structures. This sample contains seven layers, including six uh, cortical layouts from superficial to deep, and also the white matter. As mentioned earlier in a VZM data set, the entire transcriptum is measured but each spot, which is the smallest data point, may contain multiple different cells. So in this data set, the spots were annotated to vertical layers and white matter by a supervised method. But the cell type compositions of single spots were not available. After we applied SPASMIX to this data set, SPASMIX inferred better layer annotations than other unsupervised methods. Besides, the managing formulations allows SPASMIX to potentially reveal the cell type compositions at single spot level. Also, by treating the latent state as a continuum, SPASMIX also unveiled the gyrosocal gradient. So to demonstrate the ability of SPASMIX to annotate cortical layers and white matter, we compare SPASMIX with two state-of-the-art unsupervised methods, base space and spatial GTN. Here we are visualizing the in situ annotation, layer annotations of the Guangchus and the three unsupervised methods. The white lines illustrate the boundaries between adjacent layers and were derived from the true annotation. The colors in the first plot show the Guangchus, but in the red figure, the colors only separate the inferred uh, clusters, and the colors may not correspond to the one used in the first plot. As you can see, the layer annotations inferred by SPASMIX is very similar to the ground truth, especially in terms of the uh, boundary layers. In the base space annotations, the, um, the R5 cluster, uh, the red one, did not extend to the bottom. And in the spark GCN annotations, the clusters are generally not smooth, but rather pretty scattered. The dark layer also spanned at least four cortical layers. So visually, SPASMIX identified better layer annotations than other unsupervised methods. We also compared uh, SPASMIX with 
then space and such is on another on another three apple with and we quantified our advantage by the NRI score and we found that that mix shows consistent advantage over all four apple with. We then try to understand why sparse mix inferred better their annotations by visualizing uh, the residual spatial patterns of managers. But we found that the correspondence between managers and their annotations is not one to one. For example, managing A2 uh, spans the entire cortex, but not in the white matter. Managing A3 was enriched in layer two, the very thin layer, but it kind of leaked, leaked into layer three and also layer one, showing a gradient along the axis, the layer axis. Managing A6 was enriched in uh, layer six, but it, it also leaked into layer five and also white matter. Managing A7 and A8 were both restricted to the white matter, but Managing seven was much denser, whereas managing eight was uh, much more sparse. So most of the managers were not perfectly restricted to or corresponds to one particular layer. Instead, the equation of many managers shows uh, gradual changes across layers, indicating that space mix potentially captured the um, continuous gradient along the layer axis. So what most of the managers were learning turned out to be the cell type specific equation. To quantify this, we collected marker genes of major types from literature and curated the rank of each marker gene in every metagene. And we are visualizing the rank distribution of a group of marker genes in each metagene. For example, in the first row is the marker genes of astrocytes, and the highlighted box shows that the astrocyte marker genes have a very high rank in metagene A1 compared to any other uh, metagenes. This suggests that metagene A1 learns the impression of astrocytes. The spatial, uh, spatial pattern of metagene A1 also supports this because uh, metagene A1 is enriched in the most superficial layer, and it, and it's also diffused throughout the tissue, which is consistent with the known spatial distribution of astrocytes. Similarly, um, metagene A3 is for excitatory neurons at the superficial layers, and is indeed uh, metagene A3 is indeed present in superficial layers. Metagene A6 is enriched in the deep cortex, but not what matter. And it captures both excitatory neurons as a, and oligodendrocytes as the deep cortex. And metagene seven is captured, capturing oligodendrocytes that are in the white matter. So the managing formulation enables space mix to learn uh, various biological factors, such as intrinsic cell types, at the spot level. In other words, space mix is designed to and is able to learn a rep latent representation that captures the spot to spot variability. This resolution is, act is actually much higher than cortical layers. And then in the downstream analysis, the single spot latent embeddings can be aggregated to unveil biological insight at the regional level, such as the already mentioned annotations of uh, cortical layers and white matter. Uh, as we take a closer look at the in situ layer annotations inferred by sparse mix, we found that layer three was actually split into two parts. This is actually a very interesting phenomenon, a continuous gradient along the gyro circle axis highlighted by the yellow, uh, yellow curve. This axis is perpendicular to the axis, the, the layer axis. Anatomically, the top side and the right side of the cortex are different and are called the uh, socus and gyrus 
respectively. Briefly, if we um, go beyond the top boundary of this field of view, we will find another part of brain tissue. So this thin gap here is separating two cortical tissues. In contrast, what are uh, what is adjacent to the right side is the skull rather than brain tissue. So the two sides are biologically different, at least at the anatomic level. Um, note that the gyros and sulcus are anatomical structures and may not have a clear boundary in the tissue. Indeed, the spasmics found two uh, metagenes which are enriched in the two sides separately. In particular, the impression level of the two metagenes shows a gradual change along the gyro uh, axis. The separation in the in situ annotations was simply because we uh, used, uh, used a hard clustering algorithm in the downstream analysis. The immediate output of spasmics is a continuous latent representation shown in the other two figures. So this indicates that spasmics unveiled this uh, trajectory. To further validate that the two sides are different in impression, we, we divided the cortex in half roughly along this uh, separation. We called differentially impressed genes between the two parts. And it turned out that more than half of genes were differentially impressed. Similar as before, we curated the rank of each gene in the two meta genes and calculated the rank difference. We found that if one gene, if one gene is highly impressed in the Gyric set, then it usually have a higher rank in the Gyric meta gene than in the other meta gene, and vice versa. So this implies that the so-called side and the gyric side are indeed different in impression, and the learned managings in spasmics revealed this difference. So since we assumed a continuous latent embeddings, spasmics can identify continuous gradients in spatial transcriptomic data sets. In, in summary, the normal incorporation of the adaptive spatial affinity and the continuous latent representation enables spasmics to infer better discrete annotations and to infer continuous gradients. So today I have uh, introduced spasmics, a novel spatially informed latent representation tool for analyzing spatial transcriptomic data sets. The technical, the technical normality enables spasmics to learn spatial affinity from the data and to infer better latent representations of, of cells and spatially variable features, which can collectively provide additional biological insights. The application of spasmics on real data demonstrates its ability for the identification of real subtypes and also on continuous trajectories and potential spatial gradients. Um, our implementation of SpaceMix can be found in our uh, GitHub repo, and our paper are uploaded to the archive. Um, note that the, cur the current version is not the latest, and we will update it by this weekend. Um, lastly, I, I would like to thank my collaborators, Ben Xiaohu and Jianma, and also members in Jianma's lab. Okay, yeah, thank you so much, Tiaming. Uh, I, I think a very, very powerful tool. Oh, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, okay, first of all, if I, if any uh, people in the audience would like to ask a question, feel free to unmute yourself um, and, uh, and ask the speaker directly. I have a question. Thank you, Tiaming, okay. for the talk. <laughs> Thanks, Ron. Uh, yeah, I, I was just curious if uh, you've, you've given your technique a try on, on sort of more chaotic samples like cancer. And um, yeah, just, just curious about your, your, uh, your experiences with it. Oh, uh, uh, we, uh, we have not, um, uh, that is an ongoing work, we have not 
uh, we just have, uh, we're still trying to apply spans mix to um, other tissues. And then there are, are we're still trying to apply it. And there are, are a lot of analysis we can do for it. And then that is, that is an ongoing work. Yeah, we, we, don't, we don't have some, we don't have much um, complete results for now. Okay, thanks. And, and I had uh, one more question. Mm. You know, with the, the brain, it, it has pretty well-defined layers, but mm. thinking about cancer, you know, you might be interested in, uh, you know, multiple spatial layers at the same time, like mm. your proximity to immune cell types versus your proximity to cancer. So um, does this tool allow you to, uh, you know, perform multiple layerings and have those layers interact the same way that the, the sort of uh, spatial... Uh, phenotypes interact? Uh, I suppose so. Um, I think um, this kind of interaction between uh, different uh, cell types can be uh, implied in the, um, the, the metagenes and the spatial affinity between metagenes in our model. So that can be uh, the, the output of the downstream analysis. Thank you. Uh, hi, Timing. I have a question. Hi. Is your method, um, would your method include the sensitivity to cell density? Like if some area doesn't have any cell, some area has a very populated region, would your method be able, still be able to detect the composition? And would you also consider the like batch effect or layer by layer effect to carry out the background noise or something? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, due to the time limit, I didn't uh, include the results, but we uh, in, uh, in a different field of view from the same um, VCM data set, we do find uh, the cell density is uh, different across different layer. And we found that uh, although Spacenic did not uh, implicitly model this uh, difference, uh, so um, the inferred latent embedding can capture the difference um, from the impression and the spatial uh, spatial coordinates. Yeah, so so the, the output can include this kind of a difference. And for um, uh, battery fact, um, for now we do not have a. Uh, I mean, for this model, we do not have this module to handle it. But we are developing uh, additional modification to space mix as the next uh, project that is still an ongoing project. Yeah, yeah and for uh, regarding the um, layer to layer variability, I guess uh, uh, they are uh, biological. So uh, maybe it is similar to this one and it, if it is, we can identify it. Hey, hi, I Oh, oh hi. Uh, uh, <laughs> Great talk, by the way. Um, I actually, I have a, a question about this slide. So the, the sulcus gyrus um, kind of axis of variation, do you see that across all tissues in the in the Maynard data set? I, I think I recall there were like 12. Oh yeah, um, uh, that's a good question. Uh, uh, the 12 FOVs are, um, are not the same. Uh, in some tissue, you, uh, in some FOVs, you only have uh, the quartiles uh, in one side, yeah, you don't have. Sometimes you don't have the quota uh, uh, that contains both sides. So um, we only uh, studied this uh, this FOV, but uh, we do not look into the managing patterns in other FOVs. But we do find the same uh, separation uh, in diff in any other uh, FOVs. So I would say yes, we can find this. Um, separation or gradient in uh, any um, in different uh, FOVs. And so what, when running the model, you, you run on each each sample independently, right? Like you run oh, only uh, on, or do oh, you run in we, like, uh, like really, all together? Uh, for this one, we've, uh, we, we run it, actually we tried both and we found that if we run it um, on all sample at the same time, it gives a better result, uh, a, a slightly better result. And uh, anyway, in any case, we can uh, also identify this uh, with this gradient. Great, thank you. <laughs>
So, Demi, I understand uh, your goal here is to uh, kind of identify spatially variable uh, mm -hmm. gene and a meta gene set uh, uh, to just from the spatial omics data. Uh, but have you uh, tried something like a, a data integration with single cell sequencing or data integration with imaging to further enhance your uh, analytical results? Oh, yes, yeah, that's a good question. Um so uh, uh, so in our implementation, we can take an additional uh, data set, a single a single cell oriented data set as an additional field of view uh, without any uh, special information. So uh, our model can take it as an input, but uh, there are some technical difficulty like batch effects, you know, uh, special special data and then single cell RNA-6 usually have a very different um, depression distribution, which is a batch effect. So um, we still need to, we're still developing some new uh, models or techniques to handle this kind of batch effects. Yeah, if you try to integrate spatial sequence and spatial transcriptal sequence and data and the single cell sequence and data and the correct the batch effect, probably you will never be able to because you're taking data from different, uh, completely different <laughs> regions, <laughs> right? So single cell sequencing, you you sample the entire uh, tissue block, uh, mm -hmm. although that's the sparse sampling, but uh, in theory, it's kind of homogeneous sampling of, uh, of all different cell types in that kind of tissue block. Uh, but the the spatial sequencing data you take one slice, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I I don't think uh, if you force them uh, to do some batch correction, that may not make sense. I feel. Um, yeah, instead I found the spatial transcriptome uh, on this on a single cell from that tissue section gonna gonna be a, a kind of a subset of your entire uh, single cell transcriptome data. Um, I have another question. Um, <laughs> uh, thinking about other data sources as well, um, can you comment on the, the applicability of this to protein data like uh, IMC or, or codex? Um, you know, obviously, you don't have metagenes, but you have a single noisy gene. But um, you know, often there's, because of the, the way that the proteins are distributed, it's, it's on the, the edge of the cells, very hard to separate cells. So um, th does this, uh, the spice mix deal with that in a, in a, in a good way? And you mean the uh, subcellular resolution of um, the protein? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, uh, typically with... Maybe um, uh, uh, sometimes we may know um, the density of the protein in different um, cellular structures like the um, cytoplasma or the nucleus. And that, might, that can be the... Um, the features, the, input, the impression features of that protein and can be the input to spasmics. Yeah, so as a matter of spasmics can be, can be applied to um, that kind of data. Yeah. Oh, so are, are you saying you would, you would apply spice? Uh, I see, I see. So um, you, you're doing sort of pixel based, you're thinking. Oh, uh, and uh, oh, we still need to uh, somehow aggregate the pixels into single cells. Right. Um, yeah, by segmentation, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, uh, if you know uh, the, 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 the pixels that at a higher resolution, you may have, uh, uh, even if you have only one protein, the one protein can have multiple features, which is, uh, which is uh, extensity in, in different uh, cellular structures. Yes, they are still at single cell level, but you, you may have a higher resolution, higher resolution of features. Yeah, have you tried this in uh, with, with protein data? Uh, not yet. <laughs> not yet. Thanks. Yeah, that that's kind of the question I want to ask as well. Oh. Now, what Alex has asked, uh, but um, I I think related to that, uh, you show your data analysis uh, uh, from from star map, right, and mm. uh, from sick fish. Uh, these two types of data uh, have very, very uh, different sort of, sort of the, the multiplexing uh, or depth sort of number of mm. genes or yeah. uh, 
so my impression is star map is a very very low coverage or very limited subset of genes you detect. Uh, I, I don't know which data you, you use. Um, I, I think probably only like a 100, 200 genes. But sick fish is like a 10,000. Uh, um, yeah. Um, uh, oh, um, in the star map data sets, there are like three different uh, data sets. Yeah. Uh, one of them has 1,000 genes. And that okay, that, yeah, that that's one the is, one you uh, use. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay, okay. So yes. have you tried something like a very, very low? Uh, oh, <laughs> kind I know. Of gene well, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm curious about this because uh, if you can get a relatively unbiased uh, uh, cell clustering and a cell type ident identification without the need for looking at so many genes, that, that's actually fantastic, right? Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, right. Uh, no, we, we haven't tried it yet. Uh, mm -hmm. No, not yet. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, basically the, why that question is related to what Alex has asked is uh, nowadays for protein, uh, for, for multiplex protein imaging uh, is still quite limited and no one can do hundreds of proteins. Um, so Mm -hmm. uh, if your uh, computational pipeline can handle extremely low plex, uh, something like a 50 plex, you, you, you still get a relatively unbiased cell type identification and also mm -hmm. to detect the rare cells. That's huge. That's yeah, actually that's very, yeah, that's idea. very yeah. useful. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so any more questions from the audience? Okay, uh, so if not, uh, thank you, Timmy. Uh, very, very uh, interesting uh, talk and also very, very powerful too. I just can't wait to try it myself. Um, okay, thank you all for attending. Uh, so next week, uh, we're gonna have um, uh, Marion, Ma uh, Dr. Marion uh, Stokios uh, from Tenx Genomics to talk about the Vism Spatial Proteome Genomics Technology. I hope you all can join back and uh, uh, look forward to seeing you all and uh, uh, have a good weekend. All right.